Please take your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 4, John chapter 4. We're actually going to take a little bit of a break from Nehemiah, uh, mainly because while you're watching this, I'm on vacation and I'll pick it up next week. Um, but I really felt led of the Lord to go to John chapter 4 and talk about one of the core values and in our church and that is biblical evangelism i'm afraid that we've really got the idea of evangelism in church culture really messed up um we think that if we go out and and uh give out tracts that's evangelism you know that's all fine well and good and i'm not saying that's bad but really that's not evangelism we think if we go out and um, help the poor, that that's evangelism. We need to help the poor. Yes. Uh, we think that if we go and, um, you know, dig wells in Africa, that that's evangelism and that's missions. Look, we need to do all those things. But what, what evangelism is, is opening up your mouth and sharing the gospel with people. Sharing the gospel with people. Now, another misconception of evangelism is that you have to save people. You know, one reason people don't go share the gospel any more than what they do is because they don't see a lot of results. Well, be honest with you, it's not our job to get results. It's God's job to give the results. So, uh, there's no better person... And that to explore when it comes to uh, evangelism than that of the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the greatest outreach evangelistic person who ever lived. So uh, as we were going to dive into our text today, and we're going to look at John chapter 4, John chapter 4, and as you turn there, uh, I got a few things I'd like to say. First is the word evangelism is derived from the Greek word which means good news or to proclaim good news. See, this good news is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. See, the good news is the basis of Christianity. Telling the good news is what we are commissioned to do. See, God has created everyone with a specific personality and skill set to share the gospel. There are many methods, many, there's many methods of evangelism that are perfectly good to use. Uh, however, I find most of them mechanical. A lot of people use Roman Road. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people use uh, Way of the Master. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people use evangelism explosion. Nothing wrong with that. But my friends, sometimes we get so caught up in trying to present this knowledge that we know, it just seems stiff and mechanical. In other words, we kind of try a little too hard. You see, in other words, sometimes we just feel like robots when we do it. God has made you the way you are for a reason. With this being said, God has made every believer with a unique way to share the gospel. Through this study, we will examine how Jesus, the perfect evangelist, shared the good news. We will see how Jesus engaged people in a relational conversation, 
confronted them with absolute truth, and led them to worship. Now listen, our main text will be out of John chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 45. So, we see that telling the good news is what we are commissioned to do. What do we see now? God has created everyone with specific personalities and skills to share the gospel. What else we see? For we see step one in the evangelism is relational conversation. Step one in evangelism, guess what you have to do? You have to open your mouth. You have to speak to people. First, we see a relationships are important to God. Relationships are important to God. As we dive into our main text, we see that Jesus, the master evangelist, valued relationships. Not only does he value relationships, but he is intentional in his relationships. In verse 4, we see that Jesus... Uh, that Jesus found it necessary to go to Jerusalem. So let's read our text. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus <clears throat> excuse me, was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again from Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. See, the Jews of the day would also take the, they would take the longest route to get away from Samaria. But here we see that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus knew that this town needed a Savior. See, Jesus began the relationship with the Samaritan through a woman at the well. He had to go there. Notice that the people of the town did not initiate the relationship. Notice in our text, notice, let's read a little bit more. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob now, uh, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Listen to me. No one in the town came to Jesus. It was Jesus who went to them. It was Jesus who went to them. It was Jesus that pursued the relationship. God has always been the one to initiate the relationship with man. See, when we open our Bibles to Genesis, we see that God created man to be in a relationship with him. In fact, we see that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Now, how... How wild would that be to walk with God in the cool of the day? We see this mentioned in, in Genesis 3.8. says the only way God can walk in human form is through the second person of the Trinity. We can now see that Adam walked with none other than Jesus. See, this verse seems to imply that this was a common thing for God and Adam to do. God wants to talk with us and hear from us. He wants a personal relationship with us. Now listen, in order for there to be a relationship, someone must initiate the conversation. Since God created Adam, he initiated the conversation. This is why we are created. God was not lonely. He does not need us. He is completely satisfied within himself. God created man for his glory. See, the Bible is crystal clear about this. The heavens declare the glory of God. If God created the world for his glory, then he created us for his glory. But listen, it's not about me. Life, God did not create me so I could have my best life now. 
God created me for his glory. It's all about God. Moreover, uh, that's an understatement, really. God created us to know him and love him and show him to a lost world. See, the universe is declaring the glory of God and the reason we exist is to see it and be stunned by it and glorify God because of it. Although God has created man for his glory, man has fallen short. Paul says in Romans 1, 20 through 21, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they were without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Paul says in Romans 1, 23, and man exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Listen, because man has chosen to worship the things of this earth, man has become separated from God. Because sin has entered the world, we no longer could walk with God in the cool of the day. However, God still planned to initiate a conversation with us through His Son, Jesus Christ. What did God promise Adam and Eve? <laughs> he promised that He would send a Redeemer that would crush the head of the serpent and restore humanity's relationship with Him. So you listen, from Genesis to Revelation, we see God initiating a conversation with humanity. As we look back at John chapter 4, we see that God, we see that the God of the Bible is doing what He has always done. He is pursuing those He loves. He met the woman at the heat of the day. Listen, this was the worst time of the day. This was at about noon. This is when it was the hottest. It is where this woman could go and be alone and not have to hear the gossiping words of other women. She would not have to stare in the face of men that she had been with. She could go and be by herself. Listen. It's in this hopelessness of our lives that Christ comes. It's in the hopelessness of our lives that God initiates the conversation. It is at this point in our lives where we are overwhelmed by the love of God. Just like God pursued Adam and Eve in the garden, my friends, He pursues us. My friend, just like God pursued Adam and Eve in the garden, He pursued this woman at the well. So not only do we see that relationships are important to God, but relationships are important to us. Relationships are important to humanity. As Jesus began his conversation with the woman at the well, he asked if she would give him some water. So let's look at verse 5. So he came to a town of Samaria called Shychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob wells, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied, he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Give me a drink. As Jesus began his conversation with the woman at the well, he asked if she would give him some water. If you notice her attitude, notice her attitude was not the best towards Jesus. 
Why? Why was her attitude really an attitude of just leave me alone? Honestly, when Jesus speaks to us, when he is calling to us, it is in our human nature to say, God, I don't need you. Leave me alone. Oh, but listen, we can't escape the pursuing love of God. This did not deter our Lord from offering her living water. We also see on her text that this woman had been married five times and that the man she was living with now was not her husband. This was this is very important to see. See, God has created us and created in our DNA the desire to be in a relationship with others. In Genesis, God said it was not good for man to be alone. See, the first relationship we see with another human being was Adam's relationship with Eve in marriage. However, since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, every human relationship has some level of dysfunction. Sin causes humanity to live outside God's design for relationships. This leaves man unsatisfied. It leaves us unsatisfied and hopeless because the real relationship that we desire is that of Jesus Christ. Only Christ can bring fulfillment. He is the living water that can satisfy the soul. If you are a Christian, it is our job to tell people of the living water of Christ. I've heard many Christians say that they don't like being around other people. They're introverts. Hmm. They say that they wish they could just live in the room with the door shut and never see anyone. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you this attitude is totally conceited. This attitude shows the depths of of your human selfishness. It shows the depth of your self-centered attitude. See, the great commission, uh, the great commission of God told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Listen to me. That's a command, not just to preachers. That is a commission to every single believer. In order for us to obey what the Lord has commanded us to do, we must make relationships a priority. Now, here's a question for you. Why do you think that humanity is afraid of relationships? Why? Why do you think relationships are so difficult? Well, see, relationships were so important to God that He sacrificed His only Son. If relationships are that important to God, then how much important should they be to us? See, many are afraid of being in relationships because they are afraid of being hurt. They're afraid of the pain of, of being scolded. Many are afraid of being in relationships because they are afraid of being, being told no. They are afraid of rejection. See, re relationships cause pain. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that. Relationships will always cause pain. Just think of the times we have, we have broken the heart of God. Just look at how many times the children of Israel bowed down at other gods, but, but God kept pursuing a relationship with them. Jesus had a friend. He had a friend named Judas to portray him, but yet he still pursued a relationship with him. See, evangelism is not about being comfortable. 
It's simply about being obedient. Now here's the next question. Do you know someone who is difficult to talk to? Do you know someone in your family that needs Jesus, but you're afraid to have that uncomfortable conversation? Just because you tell them of the gospel doesn't mean they're going to get saved. It's just your responsibility to tell them. So I believe that everyone will probably say yes to the question. We all have difficult people in our lives. See, the next question is, how do I start to reach them? We must first start by realizing that we are helpless over the situation and that only God can change it. Next, we must ask the Lord to make a way to reach them. In order for us to build relationships with others, we should not rely on our own personality, but on the divine work of the Holy Spirit. It is not our job to save anyone, but it is our job to share the gospel. God has called every believer to be an evangelist in some way, fashion, or form. This means that we are to be intentional in our relationships in order to share the gospel. See, relationships are important to others. As we examine John chapter 4, we see the depths of the woman's hopelessness. Here we can see the emptiness of her heart. Instead of worshiping the one true God, she was worshiping her significant relationships. God has put a God-sized hole in every human being. Man was made to worship. He will either worship God or himself or other people. Worship is more than just a Sunday morning activity. Worship is fulfilling the words of Jesus. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, we see the last words Jesus gave to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Listen, God has called those who have been regenerated to, to others Listen, God has called those who have been re regenerated to go share the good news. So how do we begin sharing the good news with others? Acts 1.8 says this, that we are to go into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So, so notice what it says in Acts 1.8, that we're supposed to start in Jerusalem. Jerusalem means start, start right where you're at. In other words, start at home. When that verse was written, where were they at? They were in Jerusalem. They were starting right where they were at. Start at home first. So the question is, where's your Jerusalem? The first people you need to start reaching is your family. Let's, let's just say it like this. Jerusalem starts with your circle of influence. Everyone has a circle of influence. See, the first part of the circle is family. The second part of the circle is neighbors. The third part of the circle is co-workers. The fourth part of the circle are lost friends. Now, I'm going to ask you to do some homework, okay? Okay. Write down at least one name apiece out of each of these categories. Write down the family member. Write down the neighbor. Write down the co-worker. Write down the lost friends. Listen, identify who's in your Jerusalem. 
Now listen, the hard part is done. These are people to whom you already have relationships. The next question is, how do we start a gospel conversation with them? First, you must begin in prayer by asking God to make a way for you to share the gospel. Put the people in your prayer list and pray for them every day. Ask the Lord for those divine appointments. Second, we need to be conscious. We need to be conscious of the conversations you have. In other words, look for an open door to share the gospel. Third, find ways to tell others how God has been working in your life. This is not to be pushy or arrogant, but to be done by leading by the Holy Spirit. The conversation is to glorify God and point to Him. Talk about what you read in your devotional time, the experience you had at church the past Sunday, or give them your personal testimony. Now, if you have never written out your testimony, I encourage you to do that. Write out your testimony. So that whenever an opportunity arises, that you can share what God's done in your life. See, listen, the number one reason people do not share the gospel is fear. It's fear. See, first we have a fear of man. No one wants to feel rejected. No one wants to be persecuted. No one wants to be alone. We have a fear of, of people really knowing who we are. See, so God knows the motivation of the heart. God knows the hidden secrets of our lives. See, so the number one way we are able to share the gospel is by having complete dependence on Christ. We are to have complete dependence in His work on the cross. Remember that Christ died for sinners. Remember that Christ died for sinners? Remember that you can add nothing to the cross. When you share the gospel, you can add nothing to what God has done. It's His work, not yours. We are to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we are to be faithful in reading and studying God's Word. We are to be faithful in seeking Him in prayer. You see, this was a short message, but it's a needed message. Because I have so many people that go to church, that come to me, and they tell me about their lost neighbors, friends, and loved ones. And they'll come to me and they'll say, Wilson, will you go tell them about Jesus? Listen, I love telling people about Jesus, but listen, listen. It's your job too. It's your job to go share the gospel. It's your job to go to them too and tell them about Jesus and how He died on the cross. He rose from the dead and how He can live eternally with us. Listen to me. It's our job, not just my job. It's a shame. That parents will come to me and they'll say, Wilson, when you tell my child about Jesus, I'm like, why can't you tell your child about Jesus? I will gladly talk with them. I'll gladly lead them in the truth of Scripture. But listen to me. God has put that child in your life for a reason. He has put that, that child in a relationship with you for a reason. My friends, the end result of our text out of John chapter 4 is that this woman at the well gets radically saved and not only is her life changed, but the, but the whole life of Samaria is changed.
My friends, listen to me. That's what God has called us to do. As I close, remember that Jesus loves you. And I do too. Next week we'll be back in the book of Nehemiah. Thank you for joining us today here at Rekindled Ministries Cross Point West. We have a few important announcements for you. First, our kids club has been kind of in full swing now. We did our second. We had a blast. We're doing the wordless book. We did the gold page last week. And uh, this week we did the black page. And so we're revealing the gospel to them slowly and surely. Uh, and be praying for the hearts of those children that they will come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Also, we're starting our park ministry. And I'll give you some dates later on. Uh, and you can come out and join us. It's going to be a lot of fun, be a lot of blast. But listen, most importantly, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, contact us. If you have questions about the Bible, if there's some things you don't understand, call us, message us, let us know how we can help you, all right? It's real simple. I promise you, we're not too crazy anyway. I, I, in fact, my pastor sometimes calls it manageable crazy, so I guess that would be us. But listen, uh, we, we would will, we will, we will love to meet with you and talk with you. Uh, so just message us. You'll have the contact information on the bottom of the screen. But most importantly, I want you to know that Jesus loves you, and I do too.